Welcome to Sidebar, discussions with local, state, and national experts about protecting our most critical individual and civil rights. Co-hosts, Vadim's Jackie Gardina and Mitch Winnick. Welcome to part two of Sidebar's conversation with David Pepper, author of Laboratories of Autocracy. For those of you who listened to the first part, and I hope that you did, it was a sobering kind of description of what's happening in our democracy right now. But we wanted to make sure that we spent time talking about how we can take steps to reclaim our democracy. And that's what we'll be talking with David about in this episode. David, in your book, you provide a compelling argument about how we got here, explaining how democracy is under attack at the state and local level by undemocratic processes such as gerrymandering. What are you suggesting are the steps we need to begin taking now to defend democracy? Democracy's always been under attack. You always have to fight for it. And so the first step of fighting back is that observation that we are in the middle of the centuries-long battle over democracy. Do we choose to perfect it and have it reflect the great diversity of our country, or do we not? Pick a side. What's been the frame? The frame has actually been, oh, it's just a short-term battle over federal elections. That's That's what it is. That's what politics is. Do we get a majority of the Senate or don't we? Do we get a majority of the House? Nothing else really matters. So, David, is it fair to say that we've been looking at political and election factors that are just too one dimensional, Uh, you know, perhaps even in some cases just too simplistic? Basically, it seems to me that what we've been focusing on is whether we we receive the overall headcount that we wanted in the last election and nothing more. And what you're saying to us today is that this is simply not enough. Once you see the big picture, you're in a battle for democracy. You're in the same battle the women's suffragists were in. You're in the same battle that John Lewis was in. Once you see that, then we're on the right track. This begins to lay the groundwork for a much bigger and meaningful discussion, doesn't it, David? Once you see that, several things become very clear to me, at least. One, the battle for democracy is a long battle. It's not a cycle by cycle, get excited a few months out of the year, and then go back to your normal life battle. That's the losing battle if you're in a battle for democracy. It's a long battle. Plan accordingly. Prepare accordingly. Participate accordingly. Uh, do what Stacey Abrams did in Georgia. You stick with it through thick and thin. It's not just about the next federal election for a Senate seat. Stacey, I happened to go to law school with her, by the way. She clearly took classes I must have skipped. But we graduated in 99. So I've been watching her ever since. She fought this battle as the minority leader of the Georgia State House. She fought it when she started nonprofits. She fought it as she wrote books. She fought it as she ran for governor. Didn't quite win, but registered a whole lot of people and got rid of a whole lot of their voter suppression. So in 20, after decades of battling, Georgia turned blue, thanks to Stacey Abrams realizing it's a long battle. Okay, you've identified lesson number one, If we want to preserve democracy, it's not just about individual federal elections. What you've explained to us is that it's about the process at the state level. It's about challenging voter suppression, expanding voter registration, educating the public, and committing to the long-term battle to preserve democracy. David, what you and Mitch are describing takes a huge commitment and honestly, a level of resilience that is not easy for most politicians or for the rank and file in the local and state political parties. What is step two? Number two, it's a 50 state battle. Once you realize we're in a battle for democracy itself, you realize how unacceptable it is, how wrong it is that we have stopped fighting that battle in most states because they're not magically in the category of federal swing states for federal purposes. But just like you would teach in your law school class that every citizen has a right to vote, every citizen per the guarantee clause of the constitution, article four, section four, has a right to live in a state that is a functioning democracy. That's the guarantee clause of this country. Every state should be a Republican form of government by which they meant democracy. Once you see that we're battling for democracy, you see how wrong it is that we're not fighting in every state. I won't go through all the details. Okay, David, 
that was a great framing of the guarantee clause of the Constitution that reminds us that we are entitled to live in a functioning democracy. However, as you so aptly put it, defending the right is a 50-state battle that we could lose if we take it for granted. Where does it go from here? My hope is it motivates people. That this isn't about just a few volunteer hours in the campaign or a few dollars you give. Once you're in a battle for democracy itself, you do what the civil rights leaders like John Lewis told us to do. You take almost everything you do and you put it to work for democracy. I'll just give an example. A Sherrod Brown, when he was Secretary of State of Ohio, he convinced McDonald's to put on every tray in every restaurant a voter registration form. That was a great step to scale up the battle for democracy. David, even with a mother who spent decades organizing voter registration, this type of corporate engagement in registering voters somehow catches me by surprise. But as as you're making me think more broadly about this, what could or should we be doing as law schools in this effort? Every law school in this country should have a voter registration clinic where they are helping people in their community register, get on early vote lists, If they need a voter ID, help them figure out how to do that. We need to all incorporate everything we do to fight for democracy. And my hope is that once you realize that you're in a battle for democracy, that becomes a more obvious thing you should be doing than if you don't see that. David, I am starting to see the theme here that we need to be looking everywhere for the opportunity to expand voter registration. What are some other examples? When I was a city council member in Cincinnati, I oversaw the rec centers and the health clinics and the libraries, but I didn't think to use those to lift democracy. I just didn't think it was part of the job. I should have. If I were there now recognizing that we're about for democracy, I would say to the people running our health department, I want everyone who comes to our health clinics to, at the end of the sign in, be asked if they're registered to vote. And if they're not, I want them to be given a voter registration form. So once you realize you're in a battle for democracy, there are many, many steps that become very, very clear that we should be taking that too often we don't see because we don't really see that that's the battle that we're in. So I go through 30 steps in my book. There's a lot more than that. But those are some of the key takeaways. Once you come to this sobering conclusion that, yes, indeed, we are still in a battle for democracy, just like John Lewis was. We're going to take a break now to hear from our sponsors. You ought to be a lawyer. How many times have you heard this from your relatives, friends, and co-workers? So what's stopping you? Our family of California accredited law schools that include Monterey College of Law, San Luis Obispo College of Law, Kern County College of Law, and Empire College of Law provide on-site and hybrid online evening weekday classes that provide you the option to continue working while attending law school. The LSAT is not required to apply, and a waiver is considered for applicants with an associate's or bachelor's degree and a strong academic record. We're currently accepting applications for our 2023 spring and summer semesters. For more information, go to montereylaw.edu. That's montereylaw.edu. Your community, your law school, your future. Welcome to the future of legal intelligence. Trellis, a state trial court research and analytics solution. Trellis offers state trial court records for legal research with analysis on judges, opposing counsel, verdicts, motions, dockets, and legal issues. Use Trellis to discover how judges have ruled on similar motions or to gain insight into opposing counsel, prospects, and clients. To learn more, or to request a Trellis demo, reach out to Mike Suarez at mike at trellis.law or visit our website, trellis.law. Law school isn't just for lawyers. The Master of Arts in Law degree from the Colleges of Law was designed to empower working professionals to become innovative problem solvers in careers that intersect with the law. The legal field is more than what happens in a courtroom after all. The Colleges of Law, built for change, built for you. Learn more at collegesoflaw.edu. 
Welcome back. We're speaking to David Pepper, author of Laboratories of Autocracy. David, along those lines, if I could break it down into a couple of stair steps. So let me start at the, the global to see if I can get down to your call of action. All of us watched an armed insurrection on the Capitol. It's not a factual question. We watched it on television. We then watched the reaction to that by our federal, state, and in some case, local politicians. I'm, as a friend of mine used to always say, I'm Joe Lunchbucket down in the small town, and I say, what can I do about that? What should I do with that? One of my takeaways from your book was that we have an obligation as the individual citizen to say, to claim that wasn't an armed attack against our democratic elected process is false. And we need to speak up against that nationally, statewide, and even somebody across the lunchroom saying that. It's just false to say that Joe Biden wasn't elected through a process that was certified by law is false and we need to speak up. Is that oversimplification to the fact of where do I as the first citizen say, what do I have to do? What can I do tomorrow? What I would say is that's part of it. And you say it in different ways that you can say it. If one side is all, is all saying it was just a, you know, a protest and the other side says nothing, then that side with that disinformation will win. Uh, what I would say to everyone is, it's not just about getting in debates about national issues. The analogy I use in the book, and then I, I'm, I'm writing a sequel where I'm going to use it even more, is everyone has a footprint of influence in this world. How much of your footprint are you using right now to lift democracy? Most people are using a few toes. The time they volunteer for some campaigns, a few months at the end of a cycle, and maybe a few, the dollars they give, and, and some, you know, 50, 60, 70% vote. That's about it. And what I would challenge anyone to do at their local level is what other parts of your footprint could you use that you are not using to lift democracy? Put on your partisan hat for a second. It's a disaster for democracy, especially when it comes to state houses. So, David, we are now getting into the very heart of your argument and the primary theme of the book. Explain to us exactly why the state houses are so incredibly important. The reason state houses are such an effective tool against democracy is because no one knows what the hell is going on in these places. Well, what contributes to that? Dozens of these districts are never challenged every two years. You want to talk about a lack of transparency? If no one is even running against the incumbent, of course, no one knows about what that incumbent's doing. So one example would be if you're in a district where no one's running against an opponent, figure out how you can change that. Run yourself. Call your most impressive friend. Get them to run. Make sure that there is a challenge in every district in a state. Well, I actually thought about running for elective office at one time. And in fact, that's one of the reasons I went to law school, to better prepare me as a legislator. But ultimately, that was not for me. And frankly, it's not a possibility or probably of interest for most people. If you're not the challenger, help that person. Do an event, knock on doors, you name it. Figure out if you're in a state that's been purging voters. And if you're on the board of a homeless shelter or you volunteer at the food bank, ask that homeless shelter or food bank, are you registering everyone you serve? Because if you're not, I want to help you do that. Where do you get your hair cut? Are you the one cutting here? Do you live in a senior center? Could you knock on doors of every single part of that senior center and make sure everyone's registered? You name it. There are so many things we all could be doing to lift democracy that too often we're not even thinking about. David, let me step back for a minute and ask you to talk a little more about why you speak with such urgency about your concern that democracy is under attack. The scale is the problem. The attack on democracy through state houses and through state governments, the scale of it is full time and it's billions of dollars. And if all we're doing to counter that is we do a little volunteering for a few candidates at the end of a cycle, the scale of the assault, the purging, the gerrymandering, it's much too big to overcome the challenges in every single way. How can people lift democracy? Some will be more comfortable, uh, Mitch, with 
the direct confrontation in that lunchroom. Others, it may be, ah, that's too much for them. But registering people is as harmless and as positive a public service as you can do. So maybe it's being that doctor or that nurse or that teacher saying, let's make sure that people are part of our democracy. Let's help them get registered. So there's a massive spectrum. My worry is we're only doing a sliver of what we could be doing, and we need to be doing all of it to get to scale what we need to do. We're talking today with David Pepper, the author of Laboratories of Autocracy. We're going to take a short break with a word from our sponsors. The future of law is protecting personal information online. It's ensuring patients' rights are protected. It's knowing how to manage your own business. At the Colleges of Law, you'll find programs built for change to address whatever the future of the legal industry might bring. The Colleges of Law. Built for change. Built for you. Find your future at collegesoflaw.edu. Is your skill level in desktop software inhibiting productivity as a current or future legal professional? Would an elevated understanding of basic office technologies such as Microsoft Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and PDF help streamline your workday? Law School prepares students to serve clients with a breadth of specialized knowledge within the legal realm. Law Practice affords us the wisdom only experience can teach. But what about the technical skills that bring it all together? Who's addressing that need? The Legal Technology Assessment, LTA, by ProCertis is a benchmark assessment and a training platform for law students and all legal professionals. Our online application establishes fluency within the most widely used tools of the trade. The LTA pairs competence-based assessments with synchronous active learning to provide effective, tailored training. ProCertis is reshaping online learning with a market-unique platform and approach to the upskilling and validation of skill sets for all legal professionals. Come check us out at www.procertis.com. Sailor Legal Service has been on the California Central Coast since 1991, under the same ownership and with the same capable team. Sailor is a 100% woman-owned business. If you call Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, the same capable team will answer. You can communicate with the same person each time you contact Sailor for your orders to subpoena records, on-site copying, process serving, and court services. SailorLegal.com S-A-Y-L-E-R legal.com. Welcome back. We're speaking to David Pepper, author of Laboratories of Autocracy. David, at no point in any of this have you talked about money. And I don't want to derail the idea of getting voters and getting process, but all of this at some point costs costs money. To what extent is finance transparency, dark money, and issues like that a derailing factor in some of these issues? Uh, it's obviously a huge problem. My book tries to get into what I think we can do. Uh, and I know it's I know it's a sobering book, but I don't talk about it since it's united because I worry that getting rid of that years in the making constitutional amendments or years of new justices. But I'm actually not as down about our opportunity with money as others may be. The single largest force in money and politics right now is actually the small dollar donors getting excited. If people are excited and they understand it, here's the problem. We have not given a deeper vision of how you win the battle for democracy that to put their resources against. All they know right now, because it's all we've said to them, is get excited about Senate races. So all the Senate candidates get hundreds of millions of dollars. We have to come up with ways that we take that huge amount of small dollar do donor potential and we use those dollars with a broader strategic mindset about democracy so those candidates have $30,000 each to run a campaign. So the money is there, but the vision of a, of a broader democracy game plan has not been there. So the money is not being spent in a way that protects democracy. That's what has to change. But we just haven't made it clear to them or easy for them 
to invest in a way that actually protects democracy. I could really talk to you all day about this. And and like Mitch, my mom worked the elections in the basement of the St. Paul's Church, you know, in walking distance from our house. And, and that was a big part of my growing up. And maybe that's why Mitch and I are so dedicated to this particular issue and, and rights overall. Just to make an observation, based on what you're talking about, about our centuries-long fight for democracy with the Jim Crow laws and KKK rising up after the Reconstruction period, and then after the civil rights as well, that backlash, we're seeing that same kind of violent political intimidation occur in this backlash period as well. Certainly January 6th is one example. I think what we saw with Governor Whitmer in Michigan, even Governor DeSantis and his election fraud specifically targeting voters right around election time. And I saw this morning that that first voter case got dismissed for lack of jurisdiction. So we're seeing the state use intimidation tactics, and we're also seeing individuals like militia, Oath Keepers, and Proud Boys use these intimidation tactics. What what do you think the the per, a person who wants to fight back against this, what's the response to that? I mean, first of all, the parallels to the late 1800s are scary. They're so similar. Not only the fierce backlash that I mentioned of diverse democracy, but the very tools of myths of voter fraud, cracking down on, on, on voters of color in particular, registering or participating, the intimidation that you'll see out of what Ron DeSantis is doing, you know, public arrests when they were told they could vote. What's that going to do to other people with a felony record thinking, well, my I didn't know that. Now I can't vote. I don't want to get arrested. I mean, clearly intimidation and then outright violence. You know, uh, the last couple of days, we've seen some very strange incidents at drop boxes. You're hearing about people coming up to challenge. This is how we got Jim Crow. It's not just the, the, the arc that we're seeing that's similar. It's the tactics. Again, miss the voter fraud, new tools to suppress. In Ohio and Georgia, millions purged from the rolls simply because they didn't vote frequently enough for the state's satisfaction. Outrageous. It's the same stuff as, frankly, the late 1800s. It really is. What do you do about it? I think we all stand strong for these voters. We all have to. I had a neighbor call me the other day. He says, David, I'm very, very concerned about all this talk of challenging voters. It's going to really scare people. He said, I think that Merrick Garland and Joe Biden need to stand up and say that voter intimidation and threats to elections officials our violation of the of federal law and will not be tolerated. And you know what? He's exactly right. We have seen too many times in the last 10 years, we've known about things. It was clear that Russia was doing something in 16. It was clear that January 6th was coming. And rather than getting in front of it, we've waited till after it. Now we realize the FBI and others knew all about January 6th coming and no one said anything. They didn't even tell Nancy Pelosi. And, and we did not clearly enough call out what Russia was doing in 16. So right now, in addition to all of us and local elections officials all looking out for these voters, I actually think that we need federal, we need right now Merrick Garland. Maybe Biden's too political to do it, but Merrick Garland to stand up and say, we are seeing chatter, we are seeing threats. If you do this stuff, you are going to get arrested. It is illegal. And I think getting on the front end so these voters know I, these guys have my back. They're going to be here is really, really important. So I actually, you know, as much as I thought I'm, you know, I'll talk to them. I'm not even involved. I actually went back and did communicate with people I know in Washington and say, I think that's actually a great idea. David, you've challenged us today to think about what could happen if we don't pay attention to the fundamentals of democracy, the basic right to vote, the need for government to protect these rights and the importance of not allowing elected state representatives to create barriers to free and fair elections. Your message to our listeners is that this is not a mere academic discussion, that there really is cause for alarm if we don't take action. I'm tired of us only doing things after the fact and not taking seriously enough the risk beforehand. We learned the mistake of that in 16. We learned the mistake of that with January 6th. This time, we're seeing enough of this activity. We need to get ahead of it at the highest levels.
That's a great way for us to end in terms of a call to action that we all uh, act now rather than waiting. And so, David, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and your insight with us. It was a fascinating conversation, and I'm looking forward to your next book. Thank you. Uh, it was really important for me to have David talk about some of the things or actions that people can take in their daily lives to really start to to change what's happening at the state level. And I'm a solutions-oriented person and always looking for those action items, something that I can do to change what's happening. So I'm so glad that we were able to have a conversation with him about those steps. And Jackie, I like the fact that David dug a little deeper. Many of us think that we've done enough if we donate to a cause or a purpose or a candidate. And his argument is very compelling that whereas that's important, that isn't even closely enough if we're going to the issue of not just supporting in an idea, but we're actually trying to protect democracy. I also like the idea that his call to action to us as lawyers, that we cannot stand idly by and let illegal and unconstitutional actions take place on our respective doorsteps, not just the federal, which we read about in the newspaper, but literally at our doorsteps at the state house. That's why I thought it was so important to talk or at least say out loud that fear about violence and intimidation that seeped into really not just the federal level, but the local level. And, and as we talked about school boards and local election officials really having to hire private security and making that speech around calling out those kinds of false facts or call out. Uh, the idea that elections uh, have integrity as they currently stand. And I think we're seeing that now in the news with what happened to Paul Pelosi, certainly what's happening in Arizona and other states with people standing with guns at drop-off mailboxes. And we really need to think seriously about that idea of violence being a part of our political process and what we can do to counter that. And when we think that this is just a hypothetical situation, we need to do exactly what you've just suggested is, is read and listen to the local news now. We, we are hearing the stories, as David Pepper said, if they were stories of a third world country, we would shrug and say, oh, that's just because they haven't matured into an actual democracy. And yet those very stories, when we see them happening at voting poll stations in our local communities, at school boards in our local communities, and in other public forums, they are happening. David is right. They are happening in our towns right now. And his message to us is we need to stand up, pay attention, and do our part. And I know that Mitch and I are really interested in hearing about your reactions to this particular show. So you can certainly reach out to us on Twitter, on Instagram, Facebook, and tell us what's on your mind. You can also go to the sidebarmedia.org website and you'll see how to reach us via email. And you can certainly send us your comments or your questions or your concerns, as well as ideas for future episodes, because what we want to do here is really educate people and ourselves about what's going on in the world. I also would like to thank our sponsors who helped make this available, Presertus, Sailor Legal Services, the Colleges of Law and Jackie Gardena and Monterey College of Law. Our program today is produced by David Eakin, who also composed and performed all of our music. Also, thank you to GoGo Zoger, who is our social media director, managing our gateway to our growing podcast listener community. For more information on Jackie, Mitch, and Sidebar, go to sidebarmedia.org and join us at the Sidebar.
California accredited law schools, including the Colleges of Law and Monterey College of Law, provide affordable, quality legal education in evening online and on-site classes. Our law school graduates qualify to sit for the California bar exam and upon passing are licensed as California attorneys. For more information about attending a California accredited law school near you, go to calawschools.org. That's calawschools.org.